Hello, good <laughs> evening. Uh, my name is Joanna Podolska and I represent the Marek Edelman Dialogue Center in Łódź. And the Marek Edelman Dialogue Center was opened by the city of Łódź in 2011, in January 2011. Unfortunately, it was also the, the same year when uh, the great writer, Jewish Canadian writer, Hava Rosenfeld passed away. But since uh, that moment, we wanted to publish her book in Polish. And we started to do it in 2015. This year, today, it's 100th anniversary of Hava Rosenfarb, who was born in Łódź, in Poland. And uh, we are very happy to tell you that uh, uh, the city of Łódź announced uh, the year of Hava Rosenfarb in 2023. And today, we just open it. And I am more than happy than today, uh, this evening, uh, I have a pleasure to talk to family of, uh, um, of Hava Rosenfarb with uh, that ch her children, Goldie Morgenthaler. Hello. Hello. Good evening in Poland and good afternoon in, uh, in your place. Where are you now, Goldie? In Alberta. In Alberta. Okay, and one, I want to welcome very much uh, Abraham Morgenthaler, the son of Hava Rosenfarb. Hello, good Hello. evening. Hello, nice to be with you. And where are you now? I'm in Florida in the United States. Okay, hello. And I have a pleasure to present you also Adele Reinhardt, who is a niece of Hava Rosenfarb, the daughter of Henya Rosenfarb. Uh, hello, Adele. Very nice to be here. And uh, where are you now? Right now I'm in New York. Okay. Uh, I'm in Butch, in Poland, in the place where your mom and your aunt was born. And uh, as I said, you, we are very happy that we, uh, we remember your mom and your aunt and uh, that the Polish audience has uh, published uh, her book. Uh, it is uh, here over me. And today we are talking about, uh, uh, about uh, her and about her work. Uh, but uh, we want to talk about uh, her as, as a person, as a mom, uh, um, and uh, about uh, about her as a aunt. I know that Adele, uh, Adele unfortunately today has some other duties. So she will have to leave us uh, uh, before we finish. So, but first question is uh, for all of you. If you think Goldie, uh, Abraham and Adele about Hava, about your mom especially, what do you remember? What image you have if you think about her? When you think, when you close your eyes and you think about your mom, what is the first what appear to you? Whom are you asking, Joanne? I ask uh, you, Goldie. <laughs> I think of her at her writing desk. And when I saw her writing, I knew that all was well with the world that everything was fine. I, I like, when I was a child, I didn't like to see her writing. When I got older, I did. Um, because, wow. uh, and that's really my, my image of her primarily. And Abraham? You know, I have a, a similar image, but from a longer distance. Um, I, see, I see my mother surrounded by books. So the writing area where, uh, which Goldie just mentioned um, uh, for much of her life uh, was filled in her room that was books from the floor to the, as high as you could imagine all around. And that was her world as I saw it. Okay. And Adel, how do you remember? I don't know how often did you meet uh, Hava and what is your, in your mind when you think about uh, your aunt? 
Well, we met very often. Our mothers were very close and the families were very close. So we spent most of our vacations together for certainly throughout um, my childhood. And uh, because of that context, I remember Chava in the kitchen <laughs> talking to my mother <laughs> around the kitchen table or preparing food. I mean, my image of her um, was not really of Chava the writer, although later on we talked a lot about that once, once I was an adult myself, but really of Chava the aunt, very warm, very loving, and um, very similar to my mother in all the ways that I loved. Okay. And uh, uh, Ab Abraham, you said about the books uh, that she was around her, you, you remember a lot of books. What kind of books you remember in her room? Uh, they were mostly Yiddish books or uh, what kind of literature do you connect with her? What no, it was, it, it was all kinds of books, mainly English books, um, you know, which became our main language. Uh, she had a collection of books in Yiddish, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my mother was part of a family and, and uh, Adele is part of this too, that are readers, you know, where the book is, you know, a, almost like a sacred item. You know, it's funny, I have a, a lot of friends and, and my wife in particular makes notes in the edges of the books that she reads. And to me that, uh, I can't imagine that. I can't imagine writing in a book. I can't imagine turning over the edge of it, you know, to keep your place, except maybe for a paperback, like a spy novel or something like that, where it doesn't matter. But otherwise the book was, uh, I saw something that was almost sacred. Mm -hmm. Uh, Goldie, what what do you remember from your childhood, mostly from you know the, these books around your mom? Uh, I write in books all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like to own my own books because I can write in them. Uh, from my childhood, the books um, I remember a lot of Yiddish books, and I also remember a lot of books. With photos from the get from the ghetto, from the uh, Holocaust, some of them were quite horrific. I have to say, uh, to see as a child, and I I didn't always understand. And I would ask her. Uh, when I was older, she would explain, and when I was younger, she made up some excuse. But there was a lot of books about Lodge. Um, but mostly photographs is what I remember. Oh, and as I say, English as babies, as my brother says, um, you know, a lot in French. And there were Polish books. She read in Polish, too. So um, all kinds of languages, actually. And uh, you, you said already that your family, your sister, the sisters, they were very close. Could you tell something about these relations? So Henya, uh, two years younger. Two years, two years, three years, three years younger uh, sister, and uh, so uh, how they, how this relation was. So they were chatting uh, at home. What, what they are talking about? What, uh, what they discussed? I think and, uh, they discussed everything, and I wasn't privy to most of these conversations when I was around. You know, it was uh, some of it was chatter about this one, about that one, about people in Australia, people from their pack, from their that they knew from their childhood or from the ghetto, or they had many friends in common as well in Montreal and in Toronto. Um, but I am very sure that they talked about all the personal things in their lives as well as they were growing up. And my mother always, uh, when she she talked about how close they were and also with their mother. And this was usually when I was a teenager and she and I were fighting, you know, and she would say that she never, you know, had these arguments with her sister, with her mother, because they depended on each other so much during the ghetto years. Um, and I, th I think that the closeness, uh, there were lots of reasons for the closeness, but part of it really was because they, um, really relied on each other for survival in the ghetto years, on the emotional support and all kinds of, and all kinds of other ways as well. 
Could, could I just add to that? I um, What Adele is saying, I remember that very well too, of the two sisters sitting in their uh, house coats and talking and talking. It could go on for hours. But some of the, I like to listen to them because I learned some, one of the things I learned um, that my mother never talked about and my, and my mother didn't remember and my aunt did, especially things to do with um, the camps um, and how my mother wanted to run away from Bergen Belsen and uh, my aunt and, and my grandmother basically grabbed her arms and refused to let her go. She was going to run and she would have been shot. So I think my mother never told me this. So just listening to them was it was an education and it, and as Adele says there's a lot of gossip but but that in itself was also uh interesting uh, did you, so yeah did you did you speak at home in english or in yiddish how, how it was which language both. do you use? your both uh, parents uh, know yiddish and also adele parents were from Wuch and they spoke Yiddish a lot, but how it was in your home in Canada? It was uh, Yiddish language or English? Both. Uh, mm -hmm. It was both. And in our case, it was both languages. Well, we spoke it, Yiddish up to a certain point exclusively and then um, switched to English. But even when English became the language in the home, there was a lot of Yiddish involved. My my parents were fabrente uh, Yiddishisten, you know, so they were very yeah. devoted to the Yiddish language. That's something that that our mothers and everybody in our in their circle had in common. Mm -hmm. um, and how it was in uh, uh, Goldie and Abraham? How it was in your home? It was mostly English, as I understand. Your father prefers speaking English, yes. He didn't want to continue with Yiddish. So how how, how was uh, at home? That was my brother's fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Abraham, why? <laughs> well, I'll, I want to hear Goldie's uh, comment. Okay, Goldie. <laughs> so uh, my, uh, at the beginning, we only spoke Yiddish and that's, that was my first language. It was my brother's first language too. But then one day at the beach in Cape Cod, um, a little, my father, my brother was very young and a little boy wanted to play with him. And uh, so my brother uh, answered him in Yiddish and the little boy didn't understand a word. And he said to my parents who were there, to my father, doesn't he speak language? And um, my, my father got very upset about this and realized that he had to teach his children English pronto. And so Yiddish, after that, Yiddish was a band. We spoke English. Okay, Abraham, how do you remember that? Well, I don't really remember it, but you know, when I was small, yeah. um, you know, so Yiddish was my first language also, but I don't speak very well. Um, and, and not at all like Goldie and Adele. Um, but, you know, I could say something about, you know, can I have some more milk or can you pass the meat or something like that around the around the dinner table. But that's about it. But English for me was um, uh, sort of also my way of um, being part of the current world where I was. And Yiddish to me felt like the world that my parents had grown up in that I didn't have that much to do with. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And Adele, you, you said already that in your home, Yiddish was uh, the language to communicate. Yes, it was more language, I Yiddish than English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my parents weren't concerned about us learning English, and we certainly did that once we started going to school. And their concern was more to maintain our Yiddish because of a, of a worry that we wouldn't know Yiddish when we grew up. Mm -hmm. Uh, you uh, fortunately are uh, free of women. I mean, Hava, her sister Henya, and also their mother, uh, Sima, survived the war and they were very close and they were together. So, uh, how how you, you already said that they are very close. It was something incredible, this relationship 
probably also because of his experience of Holocaust. Um, and uh, so how, how your grandmother was, how do you remember her, Silma? Did you, did she t t tell, talk to you only in Yiddish or mixture? Did she, she know English or? So could you tell it? So so it was also in touch with her. In talk, it was in Yiddish, yes. How do you remember Seima? All of you, Goldie. Oh, I. <laughs> so I don't think my grandmother. I I found uh, notebooks where my grandmother was learning English, but she didn't know it. She spoke to us in Yiddish, and that was the reason. Um, that I think um, all of us really spoke Yiddish as our first language. Um, I, I remember her going <laughs> like that to me because I once said to, I, I don't know what I did, I was very young, and I said, I didn't do that. <laughs> and my grandmother said, Nein, Goldele dus nishketin, obe Goldele's hentelech, ob mis yogetin. In other words, Goldie didn't do that, but Goldie's hand certainly did do that. <laughs> so I, I never forgot that. I, I don't. I don't remember what I did. Um, and and um, unfortunately, she was sick uh, for much of my childhood, and she did. She lived with us, and then she lived somewhere else. So, um, but but I remember her as a very warm. Uh, presence as um, as a grandmother, my only grandmother. Actually. Yeah, and Adele, how do you remember Sima? Yeah, also, I mean, we lived in Toronto. She would come to visit um, regularly. We have lots of photographs <laughs> of that uh, of those of those visits. And uh, part of what I remember is how excited my mother was every time that her mother would come to visit and how she didn't want her to go. And really just as a very warm and loving presence. I don't remember her ever reprimanding me because also because she didn't live with us. You know, she was just visiting. And of course, I was a perfect child. So I mean, there would have been <laughs> no reason. Um, but no, seriously, I remember her uh, primarily, you know, just on those visits and um, and uh, my mother's enjoyment also of them. But yeah, she only spoke Yiddish. Um, and, um, you know, but we did also. So it wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, Abraham, do you remember your grandmom? I have very few memories. She died when I was three. And, um, you know, I have, a, you know, uh, even apart from photographs, I have a vague recollection of her, but I, I don't have any vivid memories. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, uh, Hava was one of the last great writers of Yiddish literature and the most outstanding uh, woman writing in in this language. And her um, and her story is amazing for us in which reading her book uh, is just to uh, how to say. Uh, we just discover our city. We discover something what we we did not know. But I'm very curious. Uh, how do you find uh, this life, which was described by Hava? I don't want to talk only about uh, Tree of Life and the Holocaust time, but also before uh, Holocaust. I do, I don't know. Do you recognize in her book your personal story, your family story? Or do you re read uh, the book like a book with some, <laughs> some stories, Goldie? It's a very good question. Um, I have to say that I, I did not recognize this as my story in any way. And, and I also was never interested in Poland uh, when I was a child and growing up. So my mother and my aunt, spoke a lot about lunch. When they talked, they they very often reminisced about uh, things that happened to them uh, during their childhood and their school days. But for me, this was all very far away. I, I grew up in Montreal. I didn't and I couldn't um, 
imagine Poland. And uh, it was not until I actually started to go to Poland um, that um, I had a, a different point of view. So for me, when I read my mother's book and I translate her, I, I, um, it, it is a novel. I, I connect to my mother, um, but I personally, I, I don't think I, I felt a connection in, in that sense that it applied to me. Mm -hmm. Adele, it is uh, mostly, yes. How do you read a book may, uh, written by your aunt? Um, I react the same way as Goldie just described uh, to the novels. Uh, of course, I feel connected to them because my aunt is the author and um, I suppose occasionally one trait or another of a character I can recognize from, from my mother. Um, but where I did connect was actually in the essays that uh, Confessions of a Yiddish Writer and in, in the mm -hmm. biographical essays, I found those fascinating because they filled in a part of my 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 family past that I didn't know about. And it's also because it's not that I hadn't heard about these places or about some of these people, but my mother was that much younger, three and a half years younger. So her memories, for example, of going back to Koinsk and so on, um, her memories were not vivid if they were there at all, whereas Chava uh, described them, you know, and, and could provide a lot more detail because she was that much um, older than my mother and, and uh, remembered them, these events more vividly. So the, the nonfiction essays, I do relate to them as pertaining uh, not just to Chava, but to my family. Mm -hmm. But the fiction is fiction. And I think that's part of the talent, you know, Chava's talent was that it wasn't kind of a thinly veiled autobiography. It was, it was you know, these are works of, of literature. And, um, and so I read them as such. Mm -hmm. uh, and Abraham, how do you read uh, your mom books? Do you, do you discover your own story, your family story in her books? I, 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 I saw them a little differently than how Goldie and Adele have described it. Um, I, I read Tree of Life almost, of course, it's a, a fictional history, but to me, I read it almost like a, um, one reads a, a murder mystery, you know, looking for clues. And as I read through it, I was looking for you know which 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 story relates to my mother or to my father um uh did they live in this part of town that was described or this other part of town um how much of what happens in the ghetto is their story how much is not and how and and, and trying to figure it all out with uh, memories of stories that were told at family uh, gatherings you know there was a lot when i was young and you know the the uh, our our mothers <laughs> uh, would get together and they were often had uh, friends that would join them um who either were from Lodz or from you know other communities but mainly holocaust survivors and they would just tell stories and um and those stories were amazing and for a small child they were more vivid and more um they were powerful compared to the stories that most children read or have read to them in books. And I was hungry to hear those stories. And so as I did the reading as you know, I was always trying to match up some story that I remembered with whether how that worked uh, and whether it was connected to something similar that I read about. But I will say that the, the, you know, it's, I'm sure this is normal for, or common for Holocaust survivors, which is that, you know, my, my mother was 16, I believe, when the war broke out. And um, sick, uh, that's a, a intense time for all of us as we grow up. And for such a uh, amazing um, and, and difficult time frightening time. It must have been very, very intense. And a lot of the stories that that my mother or that my Aunt Henya would talk about or these other people, 
the stories were dark. Like that, and that, that's a lot of what they spoke about. They write, you know, they remembered things. And I went to Poland, it's probably now 20 years ago, and I actually went with my father. And, um, and you know, we, and I remember arriving in Lodz and we sat in an outdoor, it was warm, it was summer. And we sat at an outdoor cafe or restaurant and it was sunny. It was a beautiful day. And the world, it was a busy street and the world was just happening as if I was in any other place in the world. And it was jarring to me. It was actually difficult for me for a little while to sort of reconcile what I was experiencing sitting in Lodz uh, with the stories that I'd heard my whole uh, life growing up. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I know that Adel is going to quit us very soon. So before we will continue, I would like to ask you, what is the image of her, of your mom? And of course, have a uh, um, experience from, from Łódź, because you say so much that this Łódź is so important, these people you at home, uh, your friends, your circle you have. So this wood is very pre present. Uh, how, 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 what kind of feeling you had? Abbas just told us about his feeling when he visited uh, for the first time wood. So how about you, Adele? Yeah, I had, a, I, I, I was very uh, much interested in what Abe had to say because I had that same experience and I realized when I went to Poland, we went on a family trip with my parents and you know our own family and my brother um, to find that it was in color because in my imagination, it wasn't black and white. And I think this was partly because of the photographs, you know, as Goldie mentioned before, you know, we were, we had many photographs, um, not, not from our personal family, but you know, the, the published photographs, um, and so to me, it was a black and white world, but also because it was a world of contrast, as my mother and aunt had described it, where they were very happy until, until 1939. You know, they went to school, they had friends, there are many anecdotes and stories about, um, about their parents and their school friends and, and so on. And then of course, everything goes dark uh, um, for the period of the of the ghetto and I, and uh, and uh, throughout the war, so um, so there was a kind of ambivalence about it. But also, my mother had said always that she was never going to go back to Poland. She would never go back to Poland, and she only went back in two thousand and three because my children wanted to go with her. They wanted to see Poland for themselves and they wanted to see it with her through her eyes. And when she was there, she was very excited to be there, especially when we were, yeah, you know, because we met up at that time, but to show us the places where she had lived, where her father had worked. And we even managed to get into the small room in the ghetto where they had lived in the ghetto. It was just a, really an amazing experience. So um, we're left with this kind of um, ambivalent view of Lodz. Our family trip there changed that because we were able to meet people and talk to people. And uh, we were really um, met with such warmth and such hospitality. And that has been true of the people that we've, that we've been in touch with since that visit as well. So. I'm excited about going back in October and participating in the events that will take place. We uh, hope so. um, yeah. And Adel, could you tell something? Uh, I, I do it now with you because I know that you have to, to yeah. quit us soon, uh, that uh, you, you discover the memoir of your mom, of Henia. Yeah. Kind of, could you tell something about it? Sure, yeah. And I'm, yeah, so my, my mother died in um, June of 2021, 2021. And we were cleaning out her apartment in July. 
And deep in one of the cabinets, I found a whole bunch of Yiddish documents. I mean, there was a lot of Yiddish everywhere, so I wasn't so surprised. But as I looked through these documents, I realized that they were all, uh, as far as I could tell, from the period of 1945 to 1951. She came to Canada in 1951. And one of these documents, which I had in two copies, was a document with diary entries. Diary, so each entry was marked, you know, lodge. And the dates rain, uh, started from May um, 4th, I think, 1940, until August 24th, 1944, which was the period of the liquidation of the ghetto. But it's not, <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is, you know, my mother's diary. But it, the front cover says, Hanales Togbuch. So it's the diary or purports to be the diary of my mother's friend, Hanala. Um, and the, the beginning of it says that as my mother talking to Hanala saying, I know that you didn't survive. Uh, but when I went back to Lodge after the war, I found these pages in the cellar of the building where you lived in the ghetto. And so it's a bit of a mystery because I'm, 99.9% .9 certain that my mother did not go back to Lodge after the war. I'm certain that the, the only time she went back to Lodge was in 2003 with on our family visit. So my theory is that she actually wrote this. Um, at the end, she says that she transcribed it in Brussels in uh, July 1947. So this was when my mother was 20 years old. And I'm thinking that she actually wrote it based on what she remembered from her own diary, which she had she had kept a diary, but she lost it um, in the liquidation of the uh, ghetto, and what she remembered of reading Hanala's diary. Okay. So, so this is the document. So this is what I hope to talk about. Um, I'm working on a project on this right now, doing a translation and a kind of study of, of the document. So we are looking forward for your uh, for your presentation and probably publication of this diary, so. which is yeah. uh, so. yes. Um, so um, uh, coming back to 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 Hava uh, Rosenfarb, I uh, also remember I read a book about uh, Henya. A kind of a memoir for children, for your children, as I understand, for grandchildren. And I discover that uh, both uh, Henya and Hava, uh, they, uh, yes, they, dis they um, write some uh, differences, for instance, about their great, great parents, great parents from Koinskie and Stettel from Koinskie. Uh, so, uh, anyway, do you think that your memory, your story, what you know about the shtetl, so about your really past hundreds, more than hundred years ago, it is from the memory of your mothers? Do you have any kind of uh, other evidence or just these books you 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 have? So the diary, the book of of Henia, and of course Bociany of uh, Hava Rosenfarb. So is it, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing what, what, what uh, Hava this, uh, wrote in Bociany. How do you, maybe, sorry, I, I, I mix, uh, I, I see I, you, you don't understand my question, I'm sorry. So uh, it's about Bociany now, it's about, uh, actually it's not about the time what they could remember, Henia and Hava. But we have a story of your great parents from Koinski, from Shtetl. How do you find this story uh, about Koinski? What is, are your feelings about uh, your, your story? Do you have any connection with this story? I, I have a connection through, because through Koinsk, I discovered my cousins one of whom is listening today. I, we have, I did not know, but now I know we have um, cousins, uh, we have with things um, in common, right? So I now have a connection 
to someone in England, uh, Gideon, to someone in, in Sweden, Yerji, and someone in Israel, Victor. And Victor's mother wrote um, a memoir about uh, she was from Koinsk and she, uh, she left, right? She, she um, her, her experiences during the war are amazing. But the early chapters are about Koinsk. And that to me was very, very interesting. And so the three of us actually pooled our resources to get it translated into English. And now we're looking for a publisher. So um, that's my connection to Koisk. I was there also, I visited, but I was so sick and a terrible cold that I don't remember very much, except that it was a village. Um, so, uh, but in terms of where our grandparents, uh, our great grandparents came from, to me, the most important story uh, was not related to coins, but related to our great grandmother, who was the descendant of this very famous rabbi, Yohannes and Ibushitz, that my mother was constantly talking about. And he was a rabbi in Krakow. So somehow, I think this was his granddaughter, was my mother's great um, grandmother. So, um, and she figures in Bochani, she's one of the characters. Uh, so this fact that we have Yichis right through this very strange, very strange rabbi who um, I, I've now read a lot about him. And he is, um, nobody knows really if he was um, a follower of the false Messiah, Shabtai Tzvi, or if he condemned him. So that is, that is my primary connection uh, okay. to what's and Abraham, to you about Bochane and about your really ancient story of your family. Yes. So I told you that I read Tree of Life as if it was a mystery, you know, and tried to um, be like Sherlock Holmes or a detective. But I didn't feel that way about Bochani. It felt like uh, a story from another uh, era, another time. And, um, it, it, you know, of course, I know that there's a, a family connection there for my mother, um, but it didn't uh, speak to me in the same way. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I want also to ask uh, uh, now something about your parents. They were both from Łódź. They have a connection to Łódź. But as I understand, they have completely different uh, um, they decided in a different way how to remember the past. Could you tell something about uh, father? Did he tell? Uh, did he tell something about this his past? You have a lot of stories about your mother uh, from your mother's side. Do you have uh, also some stories, maybe not published, but you you know about your father's stories? I'll, I'll let my brother answer that. <laughs> I was going to let you answer. So the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, I don't know that. Uh, so you're right. My mother and my father both grew up in Paul, in Lodge. And, um, you know, they had experiences that were largely parallel um, during the war, certainly in the ghetto. Um, it, and the way that they handled things, at least in my lifetime growing up, though was very different. So, you know, my, my mother, through her work, and I think for other reasons, uh, and for many of her contacts, her friends and her sister, uh, Adele's mother, um, you know, Lodge and the war was still very, um, it was a common thing for them to talk about. And a lot of conversation ended up there, was about there, reference there. Um, and my father had a different uh, approach to it. Um, and, you know, he, he was troubled with, um, he would have night terrors. He was, I think, really troubled by his memories. And, you know, he would tell me that, uh, you know, every morning when I was young, he would, he would drive me to school and, and I had to go wake him up. <laughs> and, um, and it wasn't easy to wake him up in the morning. 
And, um, and sometimes he would tell me that he'd had a terrible dream and, and he would tell me that you know, he dreamed of, you know, the Nazi stormtroopers kicking in a door <clears throat> where he was and pulling him out and his family out. And, and I, his way of managing, you know, I can't even imagine what it was like to experience anything. I mean, we talked today about, uh, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, I can't even, that term wasn't around with, you know, the generation of my parents, but but if there was ever such a thing, I mean, can you imagine what that was? Hard for me, hard for me to, to imagine being in that situation. And, you know, the way that I think he managed it was to try to not think about it as much as possible. And so he engaged much more in um, uh, sort of events of, of the current day in, in Canada and in Montreal. Uh, he made friends that had no connection to the to the to what had happened before in the Holocaust. And, but there still were lots of stories and the stories often, and he would participate in many of the same gatherings that we described before with my mother and with uh, Henya or not with Henya, because we were in different cities, right? We grew up in Montreal and Adele and her mother were in uh, Toronto. And you know, it's a, it's a long drive, but we would see each other, but we lived in different cities. But my father's brother, loved to talk about the war also <laughs> and he was younger and so he was the talker but my father had his own stories and so yes we heard a lot of from my father also about lodge one way or another uh Gordy, would you like to add something um what, what i can add is that i think my uh, i think my brother is right that my father's attitude towards poland towards the war was much more complex, uh, much less uh, straightforward. He didn't get it out of his system by writing about it like my mother did. I think also that he had a harder time uh, when he was growing up in Poland, in Lodz, because uh, first of all, I have a description from him that he wrote about his own father and the kind of poverty in which he grew up, uh, it, it is mind boggling, it's just shocking. But his father, at, when he was a little bit older, his father became a city councillor for the Bund in, um, yeah. in Lodz. And, um, and then they moved to a better neighborhood. And my father, uh, after he graduated from the Medan school, which was the elementary school, where they were taught in Yiddish, he was sent to a Polish school. I don't know if it was a private school or what, and um, but it was not Jewish. And he was one of, I think, one or two Jewish students who were allowed into this school. And I, one story he told me was that walking to school, he would be um, not so much physically attacked, but, but um, there were kids who would make fun of him and would yell things at him. And then at the school, at the end, when he was ready to graduate or one year, um, he got the highest grade. And instead of giving him the prize, uh, it, it was given instead to the next Polish boy because, and he, my father always said, it's because I was Jewish. Mm -hmm. So his attitude towards being Jewish and towards Poland was a uh, was darker, I would say, and he tried to suppress it a lot, too, as my brother suggested. Um, and I think it it was the combination of those two. Whereas my mother, um, before the war, uh, she was relatively happy uh, in her schooling, in um, in living in Lodz. Her parents were also very very poor, but it wasn't quite. Um, the same kind as her father was a waiter. So um, he earned uh, pretty well, uh, well, for, uh, for a waiter. And, and, he, and they were connected to this Jewish community. So I think she felt much more um, at home in that world. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, did, uh, did you, your father, uh, Henrik Morgenthaler, he left something? He, he, uh, he gave some testimony? He wrote something? Do you have any papers? You said that you just discovered his story? I didn't just discover it. I, uh, when I went to Lodge, uh, the first time or the second time, I asked him where he lived and if he could tell me something about uh, the city, what he remembered. And he wrote for me a description of his childhood. And, and the, the, it was quite, uh, it was written in English, obviously. But earlier, I was in uh, Australia. I was visiting my mother in Australia. And um, her second husband gives me a book that was a book of um, a, a kind of Yiskor book, a book of memorials to people who had died in the Holocaust. And there was a story about my father's father written in Yiddish and describing my fa again, my father's home and especially what happened to our grandfather, my father's father during um, the Holocaust because he was killed almost immediately mm -hmm. uh, when, as soon as the Nazis marched into Lodz. So, uh, and he was taken to jail and then uh, he was tortured, horrible story. Uh, and my father was quite young then, right? I think he was about 16. Um, so that, I, uh, the strange thing was I read this in Yiddish, it was written in Yiddish. I get to the end and it says, Geschrieben von Morgenthaler Zin, written by Morgenthaler's son. And I was so not used to my father having anything to do with Yiddish that I went to my mother and I said, who is Morgenthaler's son? And she said, it's your father. And I said, my father writes in Yiddish? I, I, it was so, he, he, was, he tried so hard to to forget his roots, I guess that's the only thing to say. Mm -hmm. That um, I never heard him really spe uh, interacting in Yiddish, although he did. You know, we heard it. He, sometimes he certainly talked to uh, friends from Lodz in Yiddish, but that was when I was very young, so it was a bit of a shock to me. But yes, he he wrote. So he wrote those two things that I have. <coughs> So it sounds very, very, very interesting for for us. We can publish it as well, if you agree. Uh, anyway, uh, but Abraham, so you said that you visited to Łódź 20 years ago with your father. So I, I think probably he he told you more about his uh, his life before the war and about the places. Do you remember? Could you share with us something? So sure. What, what, yeah. So we went to, um, you know, my, my father became very well known um, for um, in Canada uh, for becoming the champion for what we might call women's rights, yeah, women's reproductive rights. And uh, so there actually was a, a Canadian film crew that was uh, making a documentary about him and his work, and they wanted um, to take him to lunch. And um, and so he agreed and uh, and invited me to come with him. And um, so we went to all the different places that he uh, had lived also in Lodge and he would go to the doors and he would knock <laughs> and people would answer. And there must have been four or five different places. And he would tell them that he grew up there and would they mind if we could go in and take a look and all of them let us in and um you know they were uh, as my sister was saying you know these were not fancy places and of course it's however many 40 60 years uh, later um but you know i saw all these different uh, places where he'd lived uh, most of them had one room two rooms um and uh and we also went to the police station uh, which is where um, uh, Goldie just described his father being taken. And there's a little, I don't know, I, I wish I, 
so I'm sure it still exists. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the name, but there's a little plaza in front of it. And we sat there and, and uh, you know, he told me how when his father was taken every day that he and his mother uh, would go there and they would bring food and they gave it to the guards, but they didn't know if he got it or not, but they brought it anyway. And then after a period of time, um, they got word, and I don't know how, which that he had died. Um, you know, my father says he, for, that he was shot uh, early on. And, um, but anyway, but, but, uh, so they stopped going there. So, yeah, I, I went and saw a lot, of, a lot of Lodge, and we went to the, you know, the area of the ghetto, and, and uh, we saw everything. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you very much for sharing it. And do you, um, uh, maybe it's also good to ask about the Bundist, uh, about Bundist background and education. Both your parents uh, um, or grandparents, uh, they were very active in Bundist uh, life in Łódź. And especially the father of Heniek, uh, Morgenthaler was a yes, very important person. And um, in this uh, world, they were both Hava and Henik in Madam School, so Bundy School. And these values of Bund were very important for them, I believe. So what about uh, your education in Canada after the, after the war? Did you go to some Bundist camps for children? Did you have uh, this kind of experience? What they, did they share with you? Uh, this, uh, yes, this good educationally uh, background of their childhood with Bund, maybe. Abraham, do you, or Goldie? Well, I, I think Gold, I, I would let Goldie go on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, they were, my mother especially, their grandparents, um, my grandparents were, were um, Yes, they were they were strong Bundes, but in Canada, so I went to a Jewish school. I went to a Jewish day school, but it wasn't Bundes. It was, in fact, uh, the Bundes and the Zionists in Poland fought all the time. But um, my mother sent uh, my my parents sent me to a Yiddish school that was Zionist. It was um, it it was. Uh, so Zion, socialist Zionist, there's a name for it that is, I can't think. And so it was socialist, sort of, but it was Zionist. And uh, I once asked my mother, there was a, a, another school that was more, uh, that would have been closer to their philosophy. And I once asked my mother why she didn't send us to it. It's called the Paris School. And, I, and she said, well, the... Um, the folk school, the school I was sent to, was a better school, and it was, in fact, an excellent school. I, I, I have always uh, been grateful for the education I got there, um, but it wasn't Bundes. So my mother kept in her head a, a certain kind of nostalgia for the Bund. She wrote poems. So she has a, a wonderful poem called "My Father and the Bund." Um, but for us, I think for my brother and me growing up in Montreal, the Bund mattered very little, frankly. Um, I don't know. Hey, what do you think? Do you agree with me? Well, the, re the reason I wanted Goldie to answer first was because um, I didn't really know much about the Bund. <laughs> and, okay. and, and just, just as Goldie um, was saying at the end, I don't think it played a role in didn't play a role in my life at all. Um, and what I knew about it for my mother was that it was important in her life. Um, and it wasn't even clear to me what Bundism was for, you know, for a, a very long time, except, you know, I had the sense that, you know, so my, as it was explained to me by my mother, the Zionists wanted the Jews to have a home in Israel. And the Bund really believed in, they were one with the people and, and uh, they could maintain their Jewish identity in whatever country or community that they were in. And my, I think my mother was very idealistic 
Um, you know, she had, I think, a romantic view of the world in a very positive way. Um, you know, that, and, and, you know, the, we've spent a fair amount of time talking about sort of the war years and how terrible it was. But, you know, the sense I got from my mother really was that life was beautiful. Uh, that that love is uh, 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 always possible and magic, and um, and that the sun will come out, and um, and it was as much the way that she described it as also uh, a philosophy of life, and so the way when I hear when I think of my mother and the word bund. You know, I see my mother uh, in my mind's eye, and I've seen photographs, and maybe that influences it. I see her going, you know, there are photographs of her being in a camp, you know, in the summer at these schools that, you know, there were Bundes camps, and, and um, she seems happy and would describe those times as being marvelous, uh, times of being together and um, unity and togetherness and uh, so that that's my connection, but I we I never got the sense from my mother that she was terribly political about any of these things. Not really. I, I also should just add that she could be quite cynical about the idealism of the Bund. Uh, she told me that um, her father um, didn't speak Polish well because it was um, he he wanted to he loved all of humanity. And yet there were, there were things that got in the way of that. And I think she was uh, quite clear-eyed about the limits of ideology and of Bundist ideology as well. Mm -hmm. I ask you about this Bundist background because, well, I uh, represent the Mara Gedelman Dialogue Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Mara Gedelman was Bundist and he all his life, he underlined that it was so important for for him this Bundist education, and uh, and you know the story of Mara Gedelman and your father, he, they they were both doctors, and uh, and uh, and it is why I ask this question, uh, but my question is also about this. But you, but you know, you know, I met I met him, I met Marek, Marek, Marek. when you were here? Met, mm -hmm. when I was there with my father. Yeah. And um, we went over to his home and um, and uh, we drank schnapps or whatever it was. And uh, but I'll tell you something interesting is that uh, he only wanted to speak Polish with my father. He didn't want to speak uh, Yiddish. And my father's Polish was, I think, pretty rusty. It had been quite a number of years since he had ever spoken it. It didn't come easily to him. And when, and I only know this from translation from my father, and when he asked, why don't you want to speak in, in Yiddish, he really sort of just shrugged and said, well, let's speak in Polish. And uh, so they did, uh, which is too bad because I can understand some Yiddish, but I can't understand any Polish. And um, but uh, uh, I, will, I will share with you one little story from that uh, where I think I did get a little bit of an understanding. So the people, you know, my father was there for this documentary. They weren't there for us meeting with Marek Edelman. Um, but um, they wanted my father to go visit Auschwitz. And my father wasn't um, sure that he wanted to go. I thought we should go. I, th you know, I would say to him, uh, "When are we? When are we going to be here again and have an opportunity?" This would probably be the only time I would ever go there. But he wasn't sure, and he brought it up with uh, Marek Edelman. And uh, and basically, Edelman said to him, "There's something in Polish uh, that used the word." He said, uh, "Basically, don't be so delicate. Delicatia maybe is a uh, Polish word." And maybe it doesn't translate exactly. And basically, he was telling my father, come on, be strong. You have to do it. Go. And that's what I, that, that sort of was the key moment for me. You know, it was like uh, in that interaction with him. He was really telling my father, you know, buck up, be strong, go. Don't be so delicate. 
and we went. Okay. And uh, was it, did your father share with you uh, his memories from Auschwitz? Did he tell you something? Well, that, that was a difficult uh, little trip. Um, but yes, of course. Um, that was, that was, that, that was, and I, and easy enough for me to understand why my father would not want to go. Um, you know, if anyone's ever been there, uh, who's watching, it's a, it's hard to not be emotional when you're there. Um, and it's, uh, um, yeah, so that was something, but Edelman was a, um, I found him very impressive. Um, he, he was a nice man and he, he was not delicate. Um, he <laughs> no, he was a strong, a strong character. And the other thing I remember is he had, uh, like everybody there, uh, sort of a little car and, you know, from the United States and Canada, you know, we said we have these big cars and somehow I was amazed that we would all fit in there. And then he parked in a garage that was barely bigger than the car. And, um, uh, it was just that, that's what I remember, but he was an impressive man. It, it is what we we remember for the first time. Anyway, even today we are living in a small houses if you compare with Americans. But uh, I want to ask about it uh, because we are now talking about uh, your father. So did you know or did, did you tell you, did you read uh, Hava's book and uh, what he said? Did, did you share with him? Hmm? I mean, did our father read? Did your father, did, did Henyek uh, read uh, uh, Tree of Life and Bociany? And what what he said? Do you, did, did you just talk to him about it? About uh, Hava's book? No, no, I don't, well, I did Abraham? Well, uh, only, only a little bit. I mean, he thought it was a magnificent um, piece, uh, you know, a magnificent book and an important and an important book. Um, you know, it's it's a, um, you know, I, I have to say, so first, uh, forgive me for, for not saying this earlier, but thank you for having this conversation and for inviting us. And it is a little bit... Um, if you'll excuse the English expression, it blows my mind yeah. um, it, to have my mother honored um, in this way. Uh, it's just marvelous, just marvelous. And, um, you know, it never, 10 years ago, even more recently, it never would have occurred to me that the city where my mother grew up um, would recognize her as a great author, as a great person. And um, the, the idea that she is person of the year in, in, in Lodge and Woods is, is amazing. I think she would be so happy, so touched by that. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, you know, what my mother did, especially in, in the Tree of Life, is she uh, captured the history of a city, of a people, a population, uh, under the most difficult times that one could ever imagine. And she did it creatively, historically, um, and in a way that was uh, so compelling. The, 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 the number of characters, the breadth of, um, the breadth of personalities and the, and, um, you know, everybody gets pulled in together into this. We all know what the end of the story is really. And um, it's powerful. And so I understand why, uh, uh, on the one hand, I understand why the city of Lodge would do this. And on the other hand, it is still incredible that it, that it happened. So I'm very touched. I'm honored to be part of this program. Yes, I, I, I absolutely second that, everything. Uh, it is really amazing. And she would have been so pleased to know 
that something like this was happening. I don't think in her wildest imagination while she was alive, would she have imagined this? Um, and so it's wonderful. It's thanks to you, Joanna. For <laughs> Thank you. Largely, especially for, for having the books translated into Polish. I mean, that that is truly amazing and kudos completely. Um, about my father reading the Tree of Life, he read it to find out what she said about him. That's what um, he told me. I also know that he read letters to Abrasha. And uh, I know this from my mother's diary, not from him, and that he cried. And um, he, he cried, and I am not quite finished translating the book yet. I've been, I got stopped because I found it so difficult, uh, the section I am at, and I understand why he cried. Um, so so that's, that was the reaction that I know about. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your memories. I hope we will come back to, we will continue. If anybody of you have uh, questions, uh, we can ask them now. But I would like to tell to our audience who are listening uh, to us um, that the year of Hava Rosenfarb in Wood just started. So we plan many events. You can see it uh, on our website of the Marek Edelman Dialogue Center. And the two most important dates are in the end of August. It always uh, the commemoration of the Litzmannstadt Ghetto to commemorate the victims of the Wood Ghetto. So last days of August. And uh, the conference, international conference about Hava and uh, uh, Jewish women writers in October, uh, in, um, organized by University of Łódź. So we have quite a great audience, and maybe uh, you will come and you will see Goldie and Abraham in person. <laughs> and uh, I hope to make for you the special walk. Uh, with our colleagues because they are many young people involved in this commemoration and Goldie already know some of the uh, young people who are very, very interested. And thank you very much for your warm words. We really uh, loved uh, Hava's literature here and we think that he, he was giving us the literature. She is really the writer for us very important personality. So um, I don't uh, know if anybody of our audience would like to, to tell something. If not, we will be finishing and we invite you to read Hava Rosenfarb books. Oh, Eva, do you want to yeah. tell something? Yes. <laughs> Please. First of all, I, I really want to join. Um, uh, thank you for organizing this. Um, I'm I'm moved beyond words. My um, my mother was a, a classmate of Hava's. Um, she was not a writer. She she her, they were a Bundes family. Um, but all my life I heard about Hava, and I was only near the end of my mother's life did I meet Goldie, and uh, we became friends, and. Um, I'm just, I can hardly express how moved I am. And thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I, uh, we will write uh, on chat our website, our uh, email address. If anybody of you would like to be in touch with the center or to see, to want to see what we are doing, please contact us and uh, maybe uh, also, you can visit Wuj soon as the Marek Edelman Dioc Center and also Wuj. Uh, try to remember uh, uh, these people who are connected to Wuj and Hava. And also we have here, I see uh, Mark Lyman and, uh, and, uh, and I don't know where is Aaron. He was here. Some people who has roots 
parents who are born in in wood so i want to say that uh, you should know that uh, uh, wood is also your city still even if you are very far from poland and from wood so yes Cody. I, I see that uh, Perla is, is here, and I was wondering, are you in Argentina? Oh, hola. <laughs> hola, Argentina. So, hola. so Perla hola. wrote to me um, just a few weeks ago uh, to say that she found my mother's letters among her father's papers. But I don't remember. Perla, was your father from Lodge 2? No, my father was from Puavi. Ah, okay. A little city southeast of Warsaw, but they, I think they never met personally from what I read in the letters, but they were both young poets uh, right after the Shoah, the Hurbun. And for mm -hmm. I think that they met through Moishe Oivet, who gave Chava to read my father's poems and gave my father to read uh, Hava's poems. And they, they uh, these are two, three letters and they speak about how to write poetry after what happened. And it's very interesting how Hava's um, attitude is to my eyes, very feminine. And my father's attitude is to my eyes as a virile uh, kind of uh, approach. It's it's very, I, I am translating the, these letters and I, I I hope to be in October in Lut. Uh, if I can, if I'm able to, <laughs> to pay the, <laughs> the, the, but it's a, it's a long trip from Argentina to Luch, so it's not that easy, but I hope to be there. And I want to talk about this in... Great. You are very, very welcome. Thank you. Uh, much. So uh, I hope you will, you will come. Thank you for uh, nice uh, words here. And uh, uh, please be in touch if you... Uh, want to do we have uh, uh, we try oh it's Tanya as well you can see on the chat some some sentences but first of all I want to 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 say thank you for Goldie and Abraham uh, also for help to publish uh, books of your mother in Polish without your help it would be more more very much more difficult <laughs> and uh, we are waiting for you here so I want to to finish this uh, meeting for today, but uh, I am sure we will be back and we will propose again the next chapter. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and see you maybe soon. <laughs>